sustainer of our lives. Amen. Please be seated. So this is what they call Good Shepherd Sunday. Apparently every fourth Sunday after Easter is Good Shepherd Sunday, and we choose texts that uh, talk about sheep and shepherds. Um, and it's true this Sunday too, you know, Jesus is there, and part of the tension in the, the gospel text is um, you have the longing of the people of wondering about who is Jesus and what is, who are you, what are you, what, who, what's happening with you, um, and he's like, I've told you. <laughs> um, and you don't believe, and there's this tension, there's this longing to kind of understand who Jesus was, and yet this kind of resistance within them, and Jesus says, well, my sheep know my voice, right? This, this notion that somehow the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Um, I'm not an expert on sheep, but I've been told uh, that, in, at least in the Middle East anyway, um, that, you know, the sheep actually do follow the shepherd. Like, they, 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 you know, the shepherd's voice calls them, and they come running, and they follow, and there's this connection that sheep have to their shepherd. They actually do trust their shepherd, that their, their shepherd will lead them to green pastures and beside still waters. Um, and so they follow, and it's that kind of trust uh, that, uh, I mean, is in some sense the spiritual journey. It is in some sense the spiritual walk of what does that look like uh, for us to have that kind of trust in, the, in, in Christ, our shepherd, right, in the shepherd of our souls? And I know for me, that's been a lifelong journey. Um, you know, back, way back in my 20s, uh, the idea of being a sheep wasn't very attractive. Um, <laughs> You know, the idea that you would somehow just follow blindly uh, seemed to be very wrong-headed and not the right approach uh, to take to life. And, um, you know, I thought I knew better, and I thought I had, there were directions that I wanted to go, and there were pastures that I thought were much better than, you know, some of these, what I thought would have been boring pastures. I'm like, yeah, no, not so much. Like, still waters? No, give me some rapids. Uh, give me some water that's got some energy in life, right? Um, and... Uh, I think developmentally that's actually kind of appropriate. That's what happens with young people often. They, they want to find their own way and need to kind of establish themselves and do their own thing in the world. Um, and, you know, over the course of time, I realized that actually the pastures that I thought were green weren't so green. And the waters that I thought uh, were palatable weren't so palatable, <laughs> you know. And, and that the meaning and the, the longing of my soul was, I mean, the longing of my soul for for genuine peace and meaning was not met uh, on that path. And so part of my journey, part of my spiritual journey has been gradually, um, you know, turning my will and my life over to the care of, of, of the God who loves me, right, of our good shepherd at some level, and trying to figure out what that means, because it's not always obvious what that means or how we carry that out in our lives. Um, you know, we're, you're, we're still responsible for our actions. We still have to make choices. We still have to do things. I mean, in some sense, the metaphor breaks down because, like, I actually don't clearly have a sheep all, or a shepherd all the time who's guiding and directing my, my uh, decisions, right? And so the, the reality of being human is, is that we make choices, um, and we have to choose directions, and we have to discern what directions are better than others, and we do that in prayer, we can do that in the context of community of people who we rely on for, for support and wisdom. Um, and we, we listen for the prompting of the spirit at some level. But really, you know, how does that play out? Um, you know, so I've been reflecting on this psalm, uh, Psalm 23, which is the heart of, of kind of that metaphor around Jesus as, as the good, or the, uh, God as our, our shepherd. You know, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Um, there's that sense of trusting that actually God does provide, and it's the intention of God to provide. Um, and it is the intention of God to lead us into us, to that place of peace, which seems very countercultural to kind of the anxiety of our age. I mean, the anxiety of our age that, that there won't be enough and, and that I've got to work really hard to get what I need and that I've got to do things to make sure that I'm protected from f further insecurity or further instability or, you know, financial, you know, disruption and, and you know, that it, it all rests on my shoulders at somehow. And so this call to somehow trust 
that actually God is good and there are green pastures that are prepared for me um, is in some sense a leap of faith. And it's, for me, I've discovered it's a posture. It's, it's, it's a way of living fully into trusting, oh, maybe I don't need to be driven by my anxiety around some of these things. Maybe I actually can step into the goodness that is there for me. Um, part of it is, you know, one of the spiritual practices that religious communities have had uh, that help them with that is the practice of Sabbath. So I was actually thinking about Sabbath in relation to green pastures and, and still waters and, and the peace that is there. Um, and people who practice Sabbath is that Sabbath is actually a full getting away. I mean, Sabbath originates, it comes from, you know, the, the Genesis story where, you know, God says, let there be, and boom, it is, and God begins creating, and it is good. On the first day, it is good, and the second day, it is good, and the third day, it is good, and the fourth day, it is good, and the fifth day, it is good, and on the sixth day, God creates humans in God's image, and it is good. And on the seventh day, God rests. And in Jew the Jewish understanding of that is God rests, not because God is tired, but God rests so that God can enjoy the goodness of what has just happened. So that God can enjoy, you know, the beasts of the field and the flying things and the, the plants and the gardens and the flowers and the goodness of creation, the stars and the planets and the nebula. Like, like there's this sense that, that in the, the story that, that God, the Sabbath is a time to, to enjoy the goodness of our lives. And curiously, in the story, that Sabbath day, is the human's first day. Like their first day is the seventh day, which is God's Sabbath. And so their first day is a Sabbath day. Like we tend to think of Sabbath as like, okay, you got to work five days, you got to do your work week, and then you get a day of rest. I mean, that's our paradigm to Sabbath is that somehow you work and then you earn what you, you get, right? But that's not how the biblical story goes. The biblical story is, no, the humans are given Sabbath from the start. They're given rest. They're given peace from the start. And that restores them to be able to then go out and live their lives. Um, that for me is like, oh gosh, how do I help get that shift in my thinking to be able to trust that actually maybe God wants to give good and that there is goodness in creation and about delighting in creation and seeing Sabbath as a way of preparing me for the work that we do in this world. Another verse in the psalm goes, um, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Again, when I was 20 years old, righteousness, like, uh, what is that word? I don't know if I, I like that word. What does that word mean? I mean, at some level, I had a, a very um, insufficient understanding of righteousness and it seemed to me that righteousness was about not drinking and not smoking and not dancing and you know not watching r-rated movies and that was righteousness um and how wrong and how thin that definition is right um i mean that the the, the again the, the jewish the hebrew understanding of righteousness is that no actually righteousness is kind of being rightly oriented it's being kind of rightly oriented into the life that God gives you, that righteousness is, a, is actually a state of flourishing. It's not a state of denial and, and you know, giving up on things. It's, it's actually that state of living into your telos, living into what God has called you to be, living into the life that has been prepared for you, and finally being in harmony and in being in harmony with that state of being. That's righteousness. It's being fully ourselves at a fundamental level and that the shepherd leads us into these paths that are actually deeply meaningful. And then the psalm goes, you know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I think what's profound about the spiritual life is that... Um, it doesn't say you're not going to go into the valley of the shadow of death. The spiritual life does not keep you from being in the valley of the shadow of death. That that is a reality of our lives. That we go into the valley of the shadow of death and we experience grief, we experience fear, we experience pain, we suffer. 
that is just a reality of our lives. But the promise is, is that you're not alone. The promise is, is that, you're, you're, that, that you're there, right? But the shepherd is there with you, right? That the rod and staff of God are there with you. And you find that in those places, right, you're given what you need. And then the psalm goes on to say, you know, that prepares the table before me in the presence of mine enemies, my cup overflows. And, and that's not a verse that ever made sense to me either. Like, why would I want to eat in the presence of my enemies? <laughs> like, that doesn't sound like a fun dinner party. Um, and, you know, it would just be weird. What, it's like there's this whole big old spread and I get to eat and they don't get to eat? You know, I mean, that's just odd. Doesn't sound attractive. And then, you know, I kind of did just this week actually realized, oh, maybe what's happened is, is, is there's, there's been this transformation and conversion that the folks who I thought were my enemies are now people I genuinely want to share a dinner table or maybe there's been this reconciliation and this process of healing and, and restoration of relationships so that the people who I thought were enemies are now my friends and my brothers and my sisters, and we are sitting there dining together at this feast of God. Like, wow, that's wild. And seems to be in character with the God that I know. It's part of the vision that's in our Revelations passage. You have, you know, all these saints gathered around the throne or all these folks gathered around a throne arrayed in white who've been through an ordeal, who've been through a battle. And here they are at the great banqueting feast of God. And then the last verse of the psalm is, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And, you know, that unfortunately, that the translations you learn are the ones that kind of get stuck with you. But the verb there, follow, right? And it, 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 it's almost like, well, if I go this way, goodness is going to go that way. And if I go this way, mercy is going to go that way. And they'll just follow me. It's like they're just tagging along, right? Like the younger brother or sister that you're not sure you really want there to be there as you're going and making your way. It's almost that that's what's getting communicated. That's actually not what the, the Hebrew says. The Hebrew is actually not that it will follow you. It's that goodness and mercy will pursue you. Goodness and mercy will chase you. You can run from goodness and mercy, but you can, they will pursue you wherever you go, even into the valley of the shadow of death. Goodness and mercy will be there. Right? You can't escape goodness and mercy running after you. And right, so if your posture is away from goodness and mercy, you're not gonna, like, you're, you're not aware of it, right? And so part of the spiritual life is realizing, oh, <laughs> Maybe I don't have to run from goodness and mercy. Maybe I can turn and let goodness and mercy catch me. That's what the spiritual life is about, is turning and letting goodness and mercy catch you. I might end the sermon there, but I want to talk about Acts passage um, because in the Acts passage, it's talking about Tabitha, who's also called Dorcas, which in Greek means gazelle. There's this woman named Gazelle. And she is called a disciple in the book of Acts. Right? She is one who is one of the I mean, that's the same word that's used for Peter, James, and John, the disciples, which seems to be this special category. She's the only woman in the New Testament that's called a disciple directly, right? So she's important. <laughs> we don't talk about her enough, so I feel like we need to talk about her a little bit um, because, you know, she's called a disciple and she's become sick with death. And apparently how she lived her life was she created clothing. And in our current context, that doesn't mean a lot because clothing comes to us rather easily. I would gather that all of us, no matter what our economic status, has several pairs, several changes of clothing. Um, if you're like me, you have more changes of clothing than you actually really need. 
right? And because it's relatively easy, like you can go into a good, like you don't have to have a lot of money. You can go to a thrift store and get good clothing, you know, secondhand, or you can go to a, a store and we do, and it's made rather inexpensively and it's made rather cheaply, right? And that's the result of the, the cotton gin and the weaving uh, revolution that happened during the industrial revolution in England and, you know, all these things that allow us. But in the, in the ancient world, cloth takes a lot of work. You have to gather whatever substance. You have to gather the wool. You have to shear the sheep or the camels or whatever it is you're using to make wool. Or you have to gather the flax fibers or the silk fibers. Whatever it is that you're using, you have to go through this long process of gathering and you have to gather enough of it so that you can gradually spin it into thread or yarn, which takes a lot of work. And then once you've had enough to then done all that work to make it into yarn, then you have to weave it to go through the process of hand weaving threads over each other to make the cloth. And then you actually make the clothing. And Tabitha or Dorcas, I mean, Tabitha is her Aramaic name. Dorcas is her Greek name. Gazelle is her English name, right? She was somebody who lived in all these cultures. She was somebody who was familiar with different cultures and, and lived and had worked in them. And she was involved in this fabrication of clothing, which was a lot of work. But she did it by blessing. She, at her, when she, after she died, it was all the widows who wanted to show what she had done. Like she had created all this beautiful clothing. She'd given them to the widows who were vulnerable, who were the ones within this culture and society who, who couldn't, you know, I mean, who, who didn't have... Um, necessarily, who needed economic support and who were vulnerable economically. And here, Gazelle was helping them out, and that was her calling, that was her ministry. And she's important enough so that when she dies, they call Peter so that he can come. And Peter comes, and he, and he prays, and she arises, and he shows her to be alive which I think is an interesting phrase. He shows her to be alive. He reveals the life that was in her. He reveals the life that was a part of who she was. He reveals kind of her life force. I think that's what it means for us to be followers of our good shepherd, Jesus. Right? We're a resurrection people. And it is this shepherd that, that leads us as we're going. We're not people who dwell in the valley of the shadow of death. We're actually people who are stepping deeper into the life that God has for us. Amen.